With all the current issues on our agenda, we tend to forget that we are in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution, which accelerates global change in much more comprehensive and faster ways. The World Economic Forum is a meeting of elites from all over the world to provide solutions to the problems of today's world. The annual gathering is held in Davos, Switzerland, with tickets ranging from $60,000 to $600,000. But the question is, do they really solve the problem of today's world? Is the World Economic Forum really important, or is it a guise to override the authority of leaders of sovereign states? Does the WEF make the world better or worse, or is it just another feel-good experience for global elites? Join us as we discuss the successes and failures of the World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum is made up of a number of prominent world leaders and billionaires that look to change the world. Since the latter half of the 20th century, the world has been increasing in prosperity at an unprecedented rate. Average wealth has increased at a rate of 3.2% annually since 1995, and the wealthiest people on the planet, however, saw an average annual growth rate of 6 to 9%. The rate was so remarkable that the UN had to double up the standard for abject poverty. Plus, in 2021 alone, according to a different study, the 2,755 billionaires in the world increased their total worth by $5 trillion. The world's top 10 richest people increased their net worth by more than $400 billion in the same year. With Tesla and SpaceX CEO Elon Musk seeing the largest increase at $121 billion. One of the biggest commitments the World Economic Forum, or WEF, has made is the pledge to fight climate change. Nearly 70% of the emissions that contribute to global warming are produced by just 100 firms. But through the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, a number of the biggest pension funds in the world are committed at Davos to decarbonizing their asset holdings. 140 of the biggest corporations in the world, including BlackRock, Microsoft, and Lloyds, are also committed to the fight. But prominent voices in the climate movement have been making this case before most of us were even born. In the 60s, it was rumored that the world would die of starvation due to overpopulation and natural disasters caused by climate change. It didn't happen. Some called it a miracle. Since the 90s, Al Gore has been making the claim that there are only 12 more years to complete annihilation of the planet, yet the sun sets and rises. No doubt we are polluting the atmosphere with carbon emissions, but the choice here is to shut down industries and leave people unemployed and starving, or pollute the environment and get to see another day. But just as we move from the worst pollutant, coal, to crude oil, the competition that drives the energy sector will result in incredible innovation that will provide alternatives for energy. Ever heard of nuclear fusion? That would be for another video. Government and business leaders joined Salesforce CEO Mark Benioff in his pledge to plant 1 trillion trees to make up for the 3 trillion trees that have been destroyed since the Industrial Revolution. More trees is a laudable goal, but is that what many world leaders fly thousands of miles in private jets to discuss? Researchers discovered that all private jet flights to and from airports serving Davos during the World Economic Forum 2022 contributed a total of 9,700 tons of CO2, which is about the same amount as the emissions of around 350,000 typical cars in a week. Last year, guests altogether used about 1,000 private aircraft. So does that mean the World Economic Forum is a vain attempt at virtue signaling with no regard for the environment or the poor? Others would say we need WEF to counter the rise of populist nationalism, the regulation of cyberspace, and the ownership of data, as well as the risks and opportunities associated with large-scale movements of people. They argue that the world's challenges cannot be resolved without the involvement of people with this degree of influence and authority. For these reasons, the argument goes, economic and corporate leadership on global governance issues is urgently needed today. It is clear that political leadership has failed to solve these issues. Governments all over the world are turning away from our shared problems. After all, Chinese President Xi Jinping is more focused on domestic economic trends and expanding China's power through the Belt and Road Initiative that he is on solving climate change or migration despite the fact that China may now have the means to take the lead. 
They say the mechanisms of governance, the resources to solve collective concerns, and the political will to act must be found elsewhere when governmental leadership fails on this scale. And because many rely on populist nationalism for their own electoral support, that's why governments have demonstrated a reluctance to address the issue. The multi-billionaire investor and philanthropist George Soros stressed the danger posed by nationalism and committed more than a billion dollars to the Global Society University Network to counter it. But in truth, it is not Nazi versus cosmopolitans, but the degrees of concentration of power. If we need the WF to wield more authority than the nation states, then those nation states would not be able to maintain their sovereignty for very long. In that sense, it would be a one government vision of the world. But the saying goes, insisting that more than ever, the world business community must take the lead and work together to address the shared problems of today and tomorrow. The World Economic Forum is arguably the most important and effective international meeting of business executives and people with the means to affect change on the scale required in the modern world. But who are the elites at Davos trying to save the world from? Definitely not China. Vice Premier Liu He of China told the audience that his nation was recovering well from COVID-19. And he used the phrases, strengthening international cooperation and maintaining world peace, 11 times. How thoughtful. I guess the ongoing extermination of the Uyghur people isn't enough to keep WEF away from Chinese money. The World Economic Forum official Paul Smikes tried to convince Washington Examiner reporter Tiana Lo that the Chinese government is acceptable for this year's conference. But the Russian government is not. But what do I know? Another factor is China's energy investment, which is the impetus behind China's rising coal use. Oh wait, China Energy Investment is a World Economic Forum co-sponsor. All right. Oh, and there's one more thing at Davos you shouldn't ignore. President Joe Biden is going to start a trade war with our European allies many of whom are members of the NATO alliance he promised to enhance, the BBC observes. The possibility of a transatlantic green trade war cast a large shadow on this. The purchase of electric cars will be eligible for $300 billion in subsidies, really $367 billion, under Joe Biden's new legislation, but only if they are mostly made in North America. Some European businesses are moving their factories to the U.S. as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act, which also has an impact on a wide range of other manufacturing and production. Even the producers of fertilizer are scratching their heads and wondering why European authorities aren't enacting regulations along the same lines. The U.S. claims that its new regulations are intended to compete with China, but the EU's leaders are outraged and ready to strike back possibly with hefty subsidies of their own that undoubtedly include by European stipulations. But why do the elites at Davos always quick to preach to everyone else? The World Economic Forum organizers warn that a polycrisis dominated by the cost of living crisis, the climate crisis, and political instability is threatening to reverse hard-won advancements in development and growth. The five simultaneous interlocking global crises of runaway inflation, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a worldwide recession, a food scarcity, and climate change could even be referred to as five gathering storms. There's no denying that our world's elites have earned their fair share of contempt. And I suppose that among many conservatives, loathing for the Davos meeting is the reflexive reaction. There is more to it than just envy of their success and influence because there will always be people in the world who are wealthier and more powerful than others. No, in many situations, Davos guests seem to be much more agitated about you, your sporty utility vehicle, your property, your diet, particularly the stake you love so much, your political views, and your skepticism about whether globalization has actually turned out to be the win-win that Davos believes it is. The problem is that so many people who have grand plans to save the world cannot help but force the rest of us to conform to their ideals, whether those ideals are questionable or not. 